Uh, today we're going to be talking about whether religion, whether theology is more important than democracy and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions towards the end. Uh, my name's Tom Elliott, I'm a radio host here in Melbourne on 3AW for my various sins in life. Um, to my left is the uh, editor of GQ Thailand and non-practicing Buddhist, Voronai Vanijaka. To his left, moral philosopher, author of books like Romulus, My Father, some of you may have seen the movie of that with Eric Bana, After Romulus, and uh, A Common Humanity, amongst many others, Raymond Gaita. And uh, to his left, uh, he identifies as a Muslim but says some of what he does doesn't quite fit him with the Muslim faith, Sydney artist Abdul Abdullah. Please make them welcome. Now, if you... You know, opening remarks, I mean, I think Australia and the world in general is at a bit of a crossroads when it comes to religion at the moment. We're seeing the rise of faith-based states, of faith-based conflicts around the world. And I think here in Australia, wave after wave of immigration is causing us to look at the things that we see as established. You know, a lot of people seem to forget that 60 odd years ago, you know, Australia was very much largely a Christian country, which it still is. But there were divisions in the Christian world even back then. We had Catholic versus Protestants. Uh, it's not widely recognised that the Queen, who is still technically our head of state, amongst her various titles, is defender of the faith. And that faith means the Anglican faith. So even though you might say that Australia is a secular democracy, the reality is our head of state is the head of the Anglican Church. So if we have an official religion, technically that is still our religion. But we need to question this. So many different areas, whether it's religious schools, whether it's aged care, whether it's issues like assisted suicide or whatever, all have a religious element. In this country there's a massive debate about tax at the moment. Why don't we have enough tax revenue? Why can't we fund the welfare state without a massive budget deficit every year? And yet we have many very wealthy religious institutions who pay no tax whatsoever. So there's a lot of questions to ask. Hopefully we'll get some answers today. And as I mentioned earlier, all of you will have a chance later on this morning to uh, stand up, have your say, ask our panel some questions. All right, firstly, now I'll go to you on this one, Raymond, and then your other two can, can chime in, but we've got a terrible war going on, or a series of wars in the Middle East right now. Some would say they're about naked grabs from political power, but to the outside observers looking in, you know, there is a, a, a faith-based element to them, and I speak, of course, of what's going on in Syria and Iraq, what has gone on in Libya. Do you think we need a secular authority to come and sort out religious-based wars? Oh, God, no. No? <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, it would be a, a, a terrible arrogance uh, to come in on the name of secularism, it seems to me, uh, with what I can't imagine with what rise one would think one could do that. Uh, there, uh, there are reasons to enter those wars. Uh, it's because uh, people are being very brutally murdered. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm, and I offer no particular political or military prescription about that. But they, and, and nobody has offered for a minute the suggestion uh, that we should uh, enter essentially as a secular, uh, imposing, a kind of secular imperialism, uh, it would be. One of the things that strikes me as strange in all the, is this discussion, though, is, is that uh, politicians are always prepared to say that this is uh, not, in, in the case of the Middle East, not true Islam, for example. Uh, and uh, I have no idea whether it is or it isn't. Um, uh, I would say the same about uh, Jewish settlers on the West Bank. I don't know whether that's true Judaism or whether it isn't. Uh, or whether the crackpot Christians in America and other places, whether that's true Christianity or whether it's not. Uh, what little I know about this sort of thing is that there is a, there's enough hair-raising material in all the sacred texts to make anybody frightened. Uh, there was once, after September 11th, there was a bit of graffiti uh, on uh, the wall in a New York saying, um, God, uh, God save us from people, please God save us from people who believe in you. 
but equally we know that last century most of the murders were by non-religious groups, by the communists, by the in China and Soviet Union and so on. So, so I, I think it's fo really foolish for politicians to say it's not true Islam, or it's not true Judaism or, or, or whatever. They're not theologians. And once you get into the whole business, uh, of, of discussing what is really Christianity, what is really... Anybody who's done it knows that the texts become very, very controversial. So why don't they just say something like, look, there are forms of Islam, or forms of Judaism, forms of, of, of uh, Christianity, which I deeply respect. And there are other claims to these religions, which I don't. And leave it at that. It seems to me. Abdul, you, you've said to me that you identify as a Muslim. How does it make you feel? I mean, you, I see claim and counterclaim. You know, you get people doing terrible things, the Islamic State saying it's in the name of Allah. You get other people like the uh, Grand Imam of Geelong just a week or so ago saying, no, such people are not Muslims. H how, do we, how do we decide? How does it make you feel? Um, it, it, it's strange, it feels very alien to me. It seems as far away, they're as distant to me as the far right is to me. Like, I, I don't really feel associated with them in, in any way. Um, but two points I'd like to make is I've, recently I've been working a lot out in Maryland where the terror raids have been recently and working with kids out there. And it strikes me when talking to them about this sort of thing is that they see it entirely as a political situation and they'll find a religious justification for having particular attitudes but they're reacting to a feeling of marginalisation or vilification or having criminality projected on them from a very young age. Like I can really see the difference from pre-9-11 and the war on terror and post and the politicisation of that identity. Um, I did have a second point. Uh, Ah, I remember it. <laughs> the, I was uh, t chatting with a, a, a guy from New Zealand last year and we were talking about what he'd done up until this point and he'd served in the New Zealand military. This is talking on the military point. And, uh, and he told me the dates or like the, the years that he served in the military and I asked him if he'd served overseas and he had. And I was like, oh, did you serve in Iraq? And he was like, no, New Zealand didn't participate. And I found that surprising. I was like, what were you doing at the, that time when you were serving overseas? And he was removing landmines in Lebanon, and I thought that was a really admirable thing, and I, I think that Australia could take a leaf out of New Zealand's book in that sense and concentrate on the humanitarian side of things and not necessarily uh, participate in the more aggressive side of things. Yeah, I'll only say to that there's a lot of New Zealand soldiers who serve with the Australian forces, so they're not officially under their government. Let's move on a bit. Vorona, you're, you're from Thailand, you're the editor of, uh, of GQ in Thailand. Um, how, how important is religion as uh, in public life in your country? Um, well, first let me reintroduce myself a little bit. Uh, some of you, or all of you may be wondering what's the editor of GQ magazine doing on this panel, but uh, I spent eight years as a political commentator in Thailand until the military coup d'etat happened, and so one thing led to another, I found refuge in fashion. But uh, in Thailand we had a coup d'etat about once every four years for the last 80 years, so it's quite a normal thing, nothing to get panic about. Now, on to this topic about religion. Um, uh, Thailand is a Buddhist country, and but Buddhists are no strangers to atrocities ourselves. I mean, right now in Burma, in Myanmar, there's a Buddhist genocide against the Muslims over there. But let me start by defining first what is religion and what is democracy. Now, I'm sure everybody has their own definition, but since I'm on the stage, here's my definition. <laughs> religion and theology are basically ideological tools used to unite people and control them or guide them in order to accomplish certain things, sometimes wonderful things like this beautiful church, theology, or democracy, wonderful thing like this beautiful country. Horrible atrocities, for example, religious atrocities, everyone here have studied about it, we all know about it, all religions have been guilty of it. Wonderful things, terrible things, both have been guilty of it. Now the situation, in my opinion, in the Middle East, is really not religious based. Religion is simply a motivational tool to get people to pick up a gun and go out and kill somebody. It's a motivational tool. The source of conflict is basically geopolitics. It's politics. 
is economic. However, when you are bombed out, marginalized, defeated, you have nothing left to grab onto. The only thing that you have left is, of course, religion. So ISIS is very effective in using that. As with any fundamentalist extremist groups around the world, you got nothing left, well, you still have God. And that's the biggest motivational tool that you can use to build wonderful things and also to kill people. And that's where we're at. Okay. Raymond, is, is God becoming less or more important in people's lives, say today versus 100, 200, 300 years ago? I, I, to, to tell the truth, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It, it's certainly not true that it's important in the political life of a nation like Australia. The simple test for that is, if you take a concept like blasphemy, for example, um, uh, in Australia no, nobody could take seriously uh, the idea that someone should be charged with the crime of blasphemy. Uh, because in order, and, the, and the interest, the, the, what's interesting is the reason. The reason is that uh, in order to be charged with blasphemy, you have to, in order to charge someone with blasphemy, you have to believe in God. Mm. Uh, what someone might be charged with is offending somebody else by blaspheming their religion, which would just be a, a, an offence against the person in the way that a racial offence might be or whatever. So, and I, to me, that's a clear test that nobody could possibly take that seriously in Australia. So whatever one says about the Queen being the head of state and all that and I don't know if uh, Parliament starts with a prayer or something like that, but it has no serious role whatsoever in, in, in political life. My, my guess is, 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 is though in the more general answer to the question that is that there are um, the kind of developments of, of, of more, I suppose you might call them fundamentalist pockets of religion because, uh, where there's a deep need to believe something very definite and treat with a certain kind of condescension people one takes to have no real values. I mean, I think whatever the motives for ISIS, one of the things that motivates young, those young men uh, is the idea that they care for something deeper than the fact that they can drink in bars, <laughs> go to the football, etc. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not trivial realising the importance of what the French were standing for when they made that stand. But it also struck me as ironical that they didn't seem aware of the contempt that would be directed towards them by these young people who were attracted romantically to the idea that they stand for something heroic, noble, deep and so on in the way that they feel so many other people in the West no longer do. Okay, you just, you just mentioned this idea of, of blasphemy. Now, Abdul, you're an artist. Art at its best challenges, it makes people think, it uh, causes people to perhaps reconsider their ideas, their preconceptions. Art often insults as well, and I'm thinking of the artist Serrano who did Piss Christ, which appeared here in Melbourne, I think it was 18 years ago now. Do you think it's okay to insult someone else's religion in a country like this? Um... As an artist, like I really don't like the idea of censorship in any way, but I think it's how people use power and in what way they're doing it. And I feel uh, the sensitivity of, say, for example, the Muslim community feeling under siege. So I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. It really depends on the situation and how you're doing it and what your intentions are when you do do the insult. I know that my work specifically can be quite challenging for the broader community and specifically for the Muslim community in the way that I present things and use images and signifiers uh, but I think if it leads to a better understanding or a better conversation then it's worthwhile. But what, but what, if, what if someone sees a piece of your art and says that insults not just my beliefs but my faith? Is your response to take it down to say bad luck, it is what it is? What do you say? Oh, I think that would be a fantastic opportunity for a great conversation. Right. <laughs> or a shoe yeah. well, uh, Tommy, in, in, in Thailand, is it still against the law to insult the king? Yes. It is. It is. And is that a religious thing, or is that just based on the idea that the king stands apart from the people? It's both. And uh, since we are recording and I have to go back to my country, 
Let me refrain from talking about this subject. <laughs> Sorry. See how potent that law is. <laughs> well, that, that in your silence, that says a lot. And I understand you don't you don't want to talk about it. But there, there is an issue here. And, and you know, when I go on the radio, I insult people regularly, not because I mean to, but because it is almost impossible to say anything to a broad audience these days without getting someone upset. But if, if I may, just yeah. just just comment on this topic a little bit. You know, I, I spent eight years as a new, newspaper columnist, mm. and my, I built my entire career on bitching and moaning and criticizing and insulting <laughs> people. So I'm a champion of free speech. I love free speech. And since now, I can't do that anymore because we have a cool regime. I have missed it so much. They have, have flown eight hours to another country in order to bitch and moan and insult and criticize <laughs> freely. That being said, free speech is not be all and in all of everything. There is such a thing as human decency. I would not insult another person's faith or religion, regardless of whether or not that religion I believe is real. I would not insult that because to me that is not decent. That is using free speech as an excuse in order to stomp your foot on what somebody else loves, what somebody else holds sacred. So I think in principle that's wrong. But again, I don't think the reaction ought to be behaving someone because of it. So there's a fine line between free speech and simple, basic human decency, which I think a lot of us forget. We get too crazy and carry away with democracy. But what about just being good human beings? Can I say something about that? Because I, I think here it's really important to distinguish between being a decent human being to another human being in ordinary life, as it were, uh, and what you do as a citizen politically. Uh, and uh, if, for example, that you find a person, uh, normally it wouldn't be a person, but it might be you're responding to someone's article in a newspaper or something like that, uh, and you find it uh, morally repulsive, uh, that, and you say that it's morally repulsive, and you might even find it incredibly vulgar as a rendition of that position. Now, if you say, first of all, it's morally repulsive and also it's incredibly vulgar, that person's going to be offended. It doesn't seem to me at all a failure of decency to say that in that public arena. There's no obligation on you if you just meet him outside to say, hey, you know what, I want to tell you something. You're vulgar and you're repulsed. That's, that's I want to say that, you, you, that, that there has to be a distinction between what is, as it were, morally decent within interpersonal relationships where nobody should, on the whole, one shouldn't just go and insult people. And sometimes what has to be said as part of a political discussion, which can be very severe, and if it's severe, tend to one, it will offend the person against whom it's directed. I always like to apply the dinner party test where you should never discuss things at dinner parties that are going to upset anybody and cause the dinner party to end early. But you're right, if you talk about things in public... All right, I'll put a... It's not very theoretical. It's theoretical in this country, but perhaps not in others. But let's say democracy is threatened by religion. And that can happen because there are, in all faiths, uh, extreme versions that do not believe in democracy. There's, there's plenty of religious faiths or branches of religious faiths, for example, that would not allow women to vote or in Saudi Arabia to drive a car. Uh, Orthodox Jews often think that women should stay in the home and not be seen out in public. If that sort of, or if those sorts of beliefs were to threaten democracy, for example, the right for every adult to have a vote, do we put democracy ahead of those religious beliefs, Abdul? I... That's a really hard question to answer. Like, I know, I can, it's a hard yeah, it's a really loaded question that comes from all different angles. Um, Saudi Arabia is a ch- I can use that as an example of no, I don't think that's a democracy at all. That, no, I, don't know. <laughs> that, that's, um, I think religion will be prioritised in a person's individual personal life, um, but a society as a whole will prioritise has to prioritise democracy. We're fortunate enough to live in a what I call a, 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 well, a pluralist socialist democracy, so I think that these things can be challenged. I don't know how to answer the question. I'm I'm going to pass it on. (laughs) (laughs) I've been bottling up for like two years. (laughs) Bent. Bent. Um, 
uh, I look at it from a different perspective. I think democracy has been kicking religion's ass for the past 400 years. And I'm saying that in the church, but I'm Buddhist. I don't answer to God, so <laughs> forgive me on that. <laughs> what I mean by that is, look, uh, democracy was able to develop and evolve and prosper because of separation of the church and the state. Yes. And that's how democracy developed in the West. Democracy has basically defeated Christianity and contained it well enough. Christianity at the core, in the scriptures and in practice, is no more or less violent than Islam or any other religion. It's just that democracy, or may I say capitalism, has defeated it and contained it. Now, that has yet to be done to Islam. So it's a different historical evolution. So I don't see religion as threatening democracy. Democracy has, in fact, defeated religion and contained it. And in fact, since the fall of communism, democracy has been the most potent killing machine on earth. And so I think democracy is very fine where it is right now. <laughs> Do you think democracy, to take up one of your points, do you think democracy will eventually, I don't like to use the word like triumph, but overtake Islam the way it has Christianity, in your words? Well, I mean, I can give you some example. Uh, look at Malaysia. It's fast becoming, becoming a developed country. I went to Malaysia many times. I've been to Malaysia. And, you know, you can drink alcohol there, you can dance, you can party, you can do a lot of things. There are still, still religious elements there. There's still Sharia law in certain places. There's still customs that they adhere to. But overall, if you compare Malaysia to Saudi Arabia, you see a vast difference. Hell, if you compare Dubai to Saudi Arabia, you see a vast difference. Because at the end of the day, what will seduce us all is superficial, materialistic, capitalistic things. Good food, fine wine, music, the good life, comfortable life, driving your cars, making your money. That, to me, the real God is, his name is Benjamin Franklin, his throne is on the $500 bill, and that will seduce everybody. You just have to give it a chance. Take a look at Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. You guys are fighting communism in those countries for years, destroyed the entire countries, killing millions of people. And now look at them. They are opening up, they are embracing capitalism, they are all changing. No need to kill anybody. Just seduce them by Hollywood, but with Taylor Swift, with Mercedes-Benz, with the iPad. And I'm telling you, everybody will kowtow to the real God. I'm, I'm Benjamin to tell here whether, you, whether you think all this is a good idea or not. I'm being sarcastic, but that's, that's a real point in there. You make a good point about Vietnam, though. I mean, I've been there. My younger brother goes there all the time. I mean, you know, Vietnam was the most bombed country on earth, bar none, and yet that didn't work, and yet, as you say, the dollar has. Raymond, um, what about laws? Should we, should we change our laws, our secular laws, to the extent they are secular, to reflect religious sensibilities? For example, in Britain now, there's a movement for things like divorce, uh, for, for wills, you know, the transfer of property, to reflect whether it's Jewish or Islamic uh, traditions. Should we change our laws to, re to reflect people's sensibilities, their religious ideas? Uh, well, um, provided it, they... Uh, Provided they, they don't violate what we, I take it that we is Australians, or, yeah, not, not we human beings, <laughs> um, because if it was a matter of we human beings, I'd more or less say what I said at the beginning, which was... What about we brought it to democracies? To, what about we brought it not just to Australia, but democracies in general? Uh, well, I, th I think provided that there's, um, there's, um, th there's particular religious communities, that, that, let's say Muslim communities or Jewish communities, uh, I mean, they actually, they do now have, have to some degree their own laws, as the Jewish community does, uh, and uh, provide they don't violate what we regard as human rights laws, then I think on the, they, they should be permitted. There is, there is a general argument, uh, uh, which, I, which I'm not sure what I think about, uh, a, a, a characteristically secular argument, which is that people who belong to a democratic constituency uh, ought, to, ought to be able to discuss matters with one another, uh, and the discussion should, uh, should at least be in, in principle resolvable. 
But if somebody, if there's discussion between people and there's a disagreement and a serious disagreement because someone says, look, I disagree a lot with this, affects my interests as a citizen and so on. And if in the end the only thing you can say is that the Bible says it or my faith says it, then that stops that discussion. So that's a classical sort of view of, of liberal democracy, that, it ought, that, that the, the people in the liberal constituency ought to be able to discuss and argue, hold each other to account. It's a kind of conversational idea. That I, the ideal is that I ought to, in my mind, have a conversation with someone in towns and will say, hey, how come? You know, you're prepared to vote for this and you haven't read a newspaper in a year and you haven't thought about it in a year. It's a kind of sense of accountability of one person, uh, one citizen to another. But then if you think uh, actually about morality, then that's not necessarily... There are a lot of divisions of opinion about this, obviously, but that's not necessarily based on reason either. So it's not as though religion is the only... I mean, a lot of our values we can't properly articulate. The deepest of our values we often don't understand ourselves and understand their sources. And we often, in regard to this conversation, don't understand their religious sources. We all talk these days very readily about the dignity of the human person with a big D, right? With, with, it, which is supposed to be a dignity that is inalienable as opposed to the dignity we can all lose when we're incontinent or whatever it is, or tortured or something. It's not clear to me that we can hold that idea on a purely rational, secular basis. It certainly has in the West its origins in religious thought. Whether it, can, whether it can be extracted from that religious thought or not, I think is a very dif difficult question. But I'm just giving it as an example of, of how, as it were, how, how difficult it is for us to understand our own deep, deepest beliefs. And so, the set, therefore, my, my point is, that simple secular argument, that the trouble with religious arguments in politics is they come to a stop with a, declara a declaration of reason stops again, that might be so with a, a lot else in our political life. Marriage. Abdul, I think you're, pro you're not married yet? No, too, not yet. Too young to shackle yourself. <laughs> I'm married. Are you married, Vorono? Nope. No? You are? Okay, there's a big debate going on about marriage in Australia, as there is around many other Western countries at the moment. Uh, New Zealand, in the last six months, has decided to uh, legalise gay marriage or same-sex marriage. Australia is having the debate in fits and starts. I think in Britain now it's been legalised. In America it's on a state-by-state -state basis, and the North East is very different from the South and so forth. What do you think? Gay marriage? Can we, will we have gay marriage if the churches continue to say no, Abdul? I think if a person is against gay marriage, that's fine for them personally, but maybe they shouldn't get gay married. But if, uh, I, think, I don't think that their, their will should be like put across the entire society. It's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a progression that we're all going to do, and I think it's going to be totally accepted. I don't think it should be even a political issue. I'm really surprised that it is. It is a political issue. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I think people should be able to marry whoever they want. It's very unusual at the moment because, of course, the former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, was criticised for being Captain Catholic and so forth. It's not widely known that Malcolm Turnbull converted to Catholicism in the last few years, and it's one thing to be born into a faith. It can be harder to shake it off, but as an adult, and in his case, in the into his 50s to decide he wanted to convert to the Catholic Church. I'm not sure it makes the case for gay marriage any clearer here in Australia. Foreigner, do you have a thought on it? Well, I think there are two types of marriages. There's the religious marriage, there's the legal marriage. Now, as far as the legal marriage goes, if you live in democracy, if you believe in equal rights, then everybody can marry anybody. So no problem with gay marriage. But as so far as religion go, you have your religion, you have scriptures, that's what you believe, that's what you believe. But, for example, it's the United States of America, not the Christian Fundamentalist Republic of America. But the, the dollar bill that you mentioned before does have In God We Trust written on it. That's the motivational tool. Right. Because <laughs> if Bush tells you, let's invade Iraq for oil, you get one reaction. Action. But if Bush say, I talked to God, and God told me, <laughs> we ought to go over there 
and kill some Arabs, then hey, you get a different reaction. Again, it's simply a tool to exploit. What about polygamous marriage? I don't know how many people here watch the... Um, Say something yeah. about this gay marriage, because I, I, I was involved in a long discussion, I mean, public discussion about this. And, um, I hope I won't sound arrogant if I say I feel there's deep confusion uh, about it. Uh, and, uh, there are all sorts of oppositions to gay marriage. There's the straight uh, sort of homophobia, right? uh, pe- people who find it just revolting. I mean, that's a visceral sort of reaction. But there's an interesting reaction where people say well, we're very happy that there should be uh, civil contracts of one kind or another, but not marriage, because then they say marriage is of its essence between a man and a woman. And what I, what I think is interesting about that, that um, idea is, is, uh, is that uh, people who hold it, I think, I mean, if you say to them, for example, well, even if it were true that marriage has always been, why can't the concept change? There can be such a thing as conceptual revision, after all. Uh, and um, what I find interesting is, is, and I think this is usually missed in this discussion, uh, is that I think those people feel that in, in gay, gay, gay sex can't go deep. They think it's friendship plus, plus sex, right? And they think that, se- they think that marriage is of, it, of its nature a deepening of sexuality in the marriage bond. And their thought, that, I think they and I've argued that this is in fact a failure fully to see the full humanity of gay people. Because if you think of the role that sexuality plays in a person's sense of identity, then to deny that their sexuality can go deep is a very, very serious denial. Much, much worse than the denial of an ordinary right. And therefore, I think I, I think the idea that they ought to be marriage equality because they ought to be able to, because it's a matter of equality doesn't take one to the depth of, of the idea of, of the of, I mean how deeply offensive. The, but but the, are you therefore saying that the churches or that those churches that deny gay marriage, which is a majority of them, actually deny humanity? I mean, is that well, the conclusion? Well I, well, I do, but there's a power. There's 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 a, this is why I think it's a really complex thing. I I, I think that's true that it is a fa- it's, it's a denial of the possibilities of depth in gay sexuality which I think is not it's not an exaggeration to say that that's a denial of their humanity but, uh, but it's also the case so for example I, there, there was a, a person at Monash University um, a couple of years ago I, I, after I was I had, had talked about this theme and so on, and I, uh, who had expressed some homophobic ideas religiously, uh, giving the rather traditional religious arguments for it. And there was a question as to whether he should lose his post. He was an adjunct post, so he was. And I, and I was asked what I thought, and I said, look, there's a... On the one hand, I think this about gay marriage. On the other hand, I notice, and it's very important, that young people uh, like you can't understand why it's an issue. Yeah? They're as incredulous that we should be discussing this as we would be if we asked us, can a white woman marry a black woman? This, for him and them, it's not an issue. But I said to them, look, you've got a professor of jurisprudence at Oxford who argues much the same as this person does at Monash. You have a professor of jurisprudence at Yale University who argues much the same as this, a little bit more sophisticated, obviously. Are you going to sack them? So, so that's, that's, I think, the dilemma we're faced in. But I would say that it, it, uh, the offence against gays in denying the marriage, especially by the liberals, who say, yes, I believe in uh, uh, that they ought to have all the contractual rights, etc., civil contracts, or whatever they call, but marriage, God forbid, that 
that's the very deep offence, and we don't realise how deeply offensive that is. But, but curiously, you just said that marriage, God forbid, and that's the whole thing. I mean, people who don't like gay marriage do tend to preface it with God forbids it. What about, just very briefly, polygamy? I mean, I have this view that once we start changing marriage, it will evolve in different ways. There, there are religious societies, some branches of Islam, traditional branches of the Mormon church, some Aboriginal tribes that practice polygamy, uh, South Sea Islanders, some practice polyamory. Um, could we see marriage in this country or indeed other countries going that way as well, foreigner? It will be very hard on a man. I, uh... <laughs> well, it might be I one man. I, I, I have a hard time. I have just one girlfriend. I can't imagine if I have more. I just, you know, I'll lose more hair. But uh, I can't speak for Australia because I'm not Australian, so I'm not sure. But there are polygamy going on around the world. In, I mean, I grew up in Texas for 10 years. There aren't polygamy in Texas, but it's America, so that I know there's polygamy in, in Utah in, with the Mormon. And, um, and I think it's a dangerous thing, polygamy, because at least as far as I know, it comes with um, suppression of the female sex, the female sex being under the male, and the polygamy that I know are often religious based, whether it's Christianity or Muslims, and it's just not a pretty thing. It's not as if you know we read in a book or see in the movies with the sultan and the harems and every little boys grew up wanting to have that but in reality i, I think it's it's, a, it's quite dangerous and if you can have polygamy i say you know a man can marry many women then a woman can also marry many men but if, uh, if adults if adults submit to say that's what we want to do uh, Bill, what do you think i mean many young people and you'll be our token young person on this panel because you are the youngest as, as Raymond pointed out, don't have a problem with gay marriage, don't even see why it's an issue, you know, let's get on with it. But would you feel as strongly or any differently about other forms of marriage? Um, I find that's another hard one to answer in that I've, I've grown up and being, well, not to, like, a good proportion of my friends are gay, but uh, none of them are polyamorous. So I'll get back to you when I... OK, need when you find one. <laughs> um, another issue that, that I think is doing the rounds at the moment is this uh, issue... And we'll, by the way, we'll go to questions in about five minutes' time, so if you've got something to ask, we'll have a couple of microphones going around the room. Um, assisted suicide. Now, last year my mother died, a uh, short but horrible battle with cancer, and towards the very end, a family friend who was a doctor, the nurse came in and they said, oh, we're going to give her a lot more pain relief now. And I said to the family friend, I said, what, what does the nurse mean? He said, oh, Oh, it's suicide. It's assisted. I was like, oh. And it was just done as a matter of course in the hospital. Now, I'm not going to say what hospital it is, but this is going on every day. Most religions tell us that taking your own life is as bad as taking someone else's. And yet, in our health system, we do it routinely for people suffering from incurable diseases. Again, is this another area where religion and democracy clash, Foreigner? Yes, it is. But um, my personal opinion is that, I mean, it, it's my life. If I'm going to go, I'm going to go the way I want to go. So assistant suicide, if I want to hang myself, that's the way I want to go, that's my right. But I think it's, it's rather dangerous in modern time that we still cling so hard on a book written by a bunch of dudes who claim that God speaks directly through them. And actually, I said that in church again. <laughs> I think it's dangerous to, to interpret the Bible so literally. And not only that, I think a lot of these religious concepts, rules and laws weren't even in the Bible in the first place. These are things that people attach on later, whether it's the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, or whatever church. They attach things on, attach things on, make all these rules and laws in order to, we go back to my original definition of religion and democracy, in order to unite a group of people and control them to achieve a certain purpose. The more rules you have, the more laws you have, the more brainwashing that you do, the better you can control this group of people. And what we are seeing in modern world is the religious faction, which still are doing many wonderful things, but also still try to cling on to that control of the people at large by clinging on to these rules and laws and still fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. So it's a conflict that will be continuing for a long time to come. 
All right, we've got about a couple more minutes before we go to questions. Um, I'm just going to ask each of you, it's a big picture one. Um, about 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, you know, Lenin allegedly declared that religion was the opium of the masses and wrote a number of times that he thought the development of a communist state would mean that religion just would have no, no relevance in public life anymore. 100 years on, arguably, religion is becoming perhaps more relevant, certainly in some parts of the world. Let's look forward 100 years from now. Will religion be more or less significant in public life? Abdul? Oh, I don't think I'll be around. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure. I, I think it's sort of going up and down in waves and how, how people are attached to them. But, uh, yeah. Uh, that's another question that I'll, uh, that I'll pass on. Like, for example, will this church still be having services or will it just become a place for having existential discussions like this one? <laughs> that's what I'm getting <laughs> Maybe at. Maybe we'll amalgamate into one spirituality, but uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Raymond? <laughs> oh, I haven't got a clue. Right? <laughs> I mean, the only thing we know about the future is that we don't know it. And um, I, I would more seriously uh, say that if I reflect on uh, the years since I first became interested in political and social matters, every major event, internationally at least, during that period was not predicted. So I have no great confidence in predicting the future. But I would say that um, whatever future religion has, uh, it's a much more complex phenomenon than you were suggesting. Uh, uh, it, it, of course it has elements of, of those functional elements of, of operating as a mode of social control. Uh, it, it, it has so many different dimensions uh, and it's, I think to, de to define it as you did is just radically oversimplifying. Mm -hmm. Which is what I do for my living every day. Vorane, uh, you, you said before that it's I, I, I can actually give a definite answer. I, I, okay. I think 100 years from now, 500 years from now, religion will still be around because religion, despite all my criticism of it, gives one thing that nothing else in this world can give, and religion can give it best, it, which is hope. 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 That's what religion gives. Whether you believe it or not, whether it's real or not. I mean, if you listen to me, you know my feelings of religion. But I can confess to you, when I find myself in danger, I will pray to Yahweh, God, Allah, the Lord Buddha, Krishna, whoever it is, because, because, end of the day, every single human being, we understand that there is a higher power, whatever that power may be. There is a high power there. There's a connection. There's a spirituality. I sometimes sit in a church or in a temple simply just to be quiet and be at peace and meditate because this is a sanctuary and that's what it gives us. So religion will never go away. It will never go away because people need hope. There's an old saying that there's no atheists in foxholes. Okay, if any of you have any questions to any or all members of the panel, please put your hands in the air. We'll get a microphone around to you uh, down here at the front and two. We'll go to you first, madam. Thank you. Uh, my question is, do you think democracy will be around in 100 years? That's a very good question. Will <laughs> democracy be around? I have a funny feeling that representative democracy is going to fall apart and, and I, I see that as a positive thing. Uh, you know, the Swiss cantons for hundreds of years have had this thing where on any sort of issue that it used to be just the men, now the women can gather in the town square and, and vote on things. And to me the, the internet gives us the ability to actually vote intelligently and efficiently on lots and lots and lots of issues. So rather than a group of a few hundred people in Canberra or in Spring Street here in Melbourne deciding our fate, I actually see democracy going very much down to the individual level. So I think it'll be a different sort of democracy, less representative and more about the individual than, uh, than what we have at the moment. And I, I think that's something that technology will give us. Um, Abdul? Yeah, I, I, well, I hadn't thought about it like that before, but that's a, there's some really good points there. And I, it's, it's interesting to me uh, what democracy represents and the different types of democracies there are. And I, like, I'd call me pretty naive or ignorant. Like, the idea, I only sort of realised recently that the House of Lords in the UK, the actual Lords, like, the, they, are. they inherit the, the, the position. So what type of democracy is that, in a, in a sense? And how in America a vote in one state might be worth more than a vote in another state. So it's, and I, well, we don't have that here 
true, but that was also shocking. Like, what type of democracy is that? And the idea that we should support democracies, for example, in the Middle East, but we support Saudi Arabia and these sorts of absolute monarchies. The, so what, what do we really prioritise? And, um, yeah, what is democracy and what democracy will be around? But I like the idea of non-representational democracy. Raymond? Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know... Um I have a lot of sympathy with with what you're saying there, but, but um, uh, since, since it, it doesn't look as though wars are over for quite a long time, uh, the, uh, political entities are going to have to be formed in such a way that there are military means of protecting them. At the moment, that's mostly the nation state it might take, which also doesn't seem to be going away too quickly, even though people have constantly been predicting its demise. Uh, and, that, and, and, and that's for the simple reason that people want to protect what they cherish. That, you know, they, they want to be able to speak their own language without someone imposing another one on them, etc., etc. Uh, and and uh, in, in whatever entity then is being protected by military force, presumably alliance with other with nations, you, you'll have to have means of voting those who control that out. Uh, uh, what I think is still so fundamental about democracy, how, how, however much we bemoan the forms it takes here at the moment, the erosion of those forms and so on, uh, it's, it's, it's really fundamental that we, we, we have means, we, A, that we can say what we wish for the most part without thinking we're going to be dragged out at three o'clock in the morning to... Uh, Although I must say, the way we talk about extremism worries me these days because uh, I, if, when I think back of my youth in the 60s, to think the, the Marxist revolutionary movements, I take it, would now be banned as extremists. So uh, well, there's a lot of potential in our democracy at the moment, actually, in the way we talk about radicalisation, extremism, and moderates, and so on. But, but what, 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 what will be, what is most important is, to, I think, to fight for, uh, is to fight, uh, to fight for that form of government, which means that you don't have to yourself fear that you'll be dragged out because the opinions have expressed in the middle of the night, and just as bad that your neighbour does. Mm. Because a country like that, can I tell a very simple story? Uh, I had a friend, a South African friend, spent six years in a South African prison under apartheid. Went with his 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 wife to Zimbabwe after he became Zimbabwe, uh, and uh, stayed there. And, and they had a son, and he came back to England. We we did, had done PhDs together in England. And I said, Why did you come back? And he said, look, I'm not a hero. Uh, I don't want my son to grow up thinking his father's a coward because, and this happened, his neighbour was dragged out at three o'clock in the morning and tortured. He doesn't want to live in a country like that. That's a hell of a blessing, mm. it seems to me. Warren, something you said before is that, you know, freedom of speech in Thailand is not what it could be, that, you know, the country's had coups fairly regularly. Uh, the question was, in 100 years, will democracy still be around? In 100 years, will, will, will Thailand maybe improve its democracy, do you think? Definitely. And uh, that, that's, a whole, another, that's a whole issue behind that, which, which I, can, I can't get into because it will always involve the monarchy. So we can't talk about that. But just to answer this question in general, and here's another one of my bombastic ideas. Um, I believe democracy will all be around as long as it is useful. Because I think democracy is the greatest trick the elites ever pulled on the mass. Simply because every four years, we have the right to go vote well, you guys do, I don't. Every four years, you guys have the right to go vote. We actually think we have power. But in effect, doesn't matter which democracy you are in, you are voting for the same group of people, pre-selected by the elites. That's why a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, today, power and wealth will always be concentrated in the hands of the one percent up top. The status quo right now with democracy, it works because they have tricked the rest of us into believing that this is the best system. And it is the best system so far. It is the best system so far. But it doesn't share the fact that the world works with the elites up top, everyone else down below. Now we're just happier. 
we have a little bit more money, we are more prosperous, and we feel like we have power because we can vote, we can go out on the street and protest. I was with the climate change protest. Yesterday, I look around, it's like, wow, this is what rich people are protesting about. In Thailand, we don't protest about climate change. We have a whole host of other problems. <laughs> but democracy will be around because it works. It is useful. Everybody is happy with it. Well, some more than others, according to you. Uh, you, sir, down here. Thanks, Tom. Um, I want to put a proposition to the panel, but in doing so, I want to make a comment just first. It'll be very short. Um, I want to put forward the, the suggestion that democracy actually acts in favour of the most powerful and the loudest voice. And it doesn't act in favour of the marginalised. And I've been in the disability field for 50 years or so. And uh, a little story. Earlier this year, in this state, we had a problem with the lost dogs home. And um, there's a great furor. And the government immediately launched an inquiry. We then had a problem in the greyhound industry. And there was a big furor and the government launched a, a, an inquiry. And so the list went on. To try and get any interest from the government or the opposition, or indeed the media, in the issue of deaths in care in the disability field is impossible. Because the disabled are in fact marginalised and they don't have the power and the influence of all these other groups. So I'm just interested in, when we talk about democracy, apart from giving us the right to vote, and apart from perhaps an array of social freedoms that we get through democracy, is democracy really about the powerful and the loudest? Well, I'll just address both the lost dogs home and disability. I mean, I took up that issue at the lost dogs home on, on radio and I think we've made a fair bit of progress. So there, there are means other than just voting for an, a member of parliament to, to get an issue raised. And secondly, you know, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was profoundly disabled and just having grown up and seeing what it was like for him trying to get in and out of a car while he could still drive and then eventually having to live in a nursing home. He had multiple sclerosis. You know, he was born a left-hander, lost the use of the left side of his body and had to learn how to write right-handed. And you know, those, those sorts of struggles just aren't noticed by most people. But there was something uh, that, and I've forgotten his name, but on last night's panel, uh, we had a, a, a blind man from Sydney who's been a passionate advocate for human rights. And he was saying that, you know, 100 years ago, he would have been a beggar on the streets. 200 years ago, he would have been lucky to have lived beyond maybe 30 or something like that and purely existing on the charity of others. I would argue that that story tells you that things have improved. They're not perfect, but, but they have improved. There was a, a West Australian member of parliament up until a few years ago who lost both his legs in Vietnam to, due to a landmine explosion. He also was a, a passionate advocate of, of, of disability. And, and look, it hasn't been funded yet, but the National Disability Insurance Scheme is a political response to a fairly obvious problem. So I would not be quite as downhearted about it as perhaps your, your question suggests. Um, Abdul, do you have a comment on that? Um, I think we can go back to your point, Ron, the, the idea of uh, yeah, serving the, the dem dem democratic systems we have at the moment do serve powerful interests, I think, and I think being in a, uh, in a marginalised position, you have difficulty getting your voice heard. Uh, but I don't know if I can add anything to it. I don't feel particularly involved in the democratic process. I've voted every year, but don't really feel a connection to it. There, there is an argument out there that most people just don't care. You know, we're all too busy getting on with our daily lives, whatever it is. I mean, once you have children, for example, that takes over a massive chunk of your life. <laughs> Raymond, what do you think? Well, uh, it's obvious, you know, let's say, in America, it's, it's increasingly oligarchic. It's just ridiculous what you have to now do to run for president. Um, You've got to have a fortune of I mean, like $100 million. I or heard something that the other day. Someone is giving a single donation to the Republican Party, which was equivalent to the amount that Obama had a raise, a raise for his whole first mm -hmm. campaign. And that was regarded as one of the highest ever raised. Uh, so, so uh, uh, obvious, that's, that's madness. It's, it's obviously true, uh, true also that it's not, nothing like that here. It's obviously true here that 
Well, it depends what you call the elite. Uh, if, if you're a parliamentary press secretary or minister, then in a way, by definition, you're part of an elite. But that doesn't tell you anybody where you came from in that society. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't deny for a minute that all the terrible flaws of what we call our democratic system. But perhaps because so much of my intellectual life has been shaped by thinking about totalitarianism, uh, what impresses me is that our jails are not full of political prisoners. And, and that, I, I might say, is kind of irrelevant here because we're talking about gay marriage. And, uh, uh, most of peoples of the earth have never enjoyed that privilege. Mm. You're, you're actually spot on. I mean, I, I feel myself lucky because I went to the Soviet Union in 1987 and I went to the People's Republic of China in 1982 when it was a much more genuinely communist regime than what it is now. And people were locked up. I went to the pre-apartheid South Africa a number of times when you just could not speak about certain things. And it all seems like when I, you know, I've got producers in their mid-twenties, I try and tell them what the Soviet Union was like. It's just an historical aberration for them, but it was very, very real. And, and I'm glad I went there in 1987. To pick up something you said, Raymond, you said, you know, we, we don't predict any of the big shifts. You're absolutely right. If you'd said to me in 87, in, when I was in Moscow, that within three or four years, all this is going to crumble and fall apart. No one would have believed you. That you would have been laughed at, and yet it happened. Now, we've probably got time for one more quick question, if anybody has one. Hands in the air. No. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I get it that uh, people who are marginalised, we've used that term quite a few times, uh, might be attracted to joining organisations, whether it's ISIS or whether it was the IRA 40 years ago or street gangs. Uh, but do we have an understanding about why people who aren't necessarily marginalised or even uh, in, in some form of poverty yeah, maybe uh, Osama bin Laden and others who are very wealthy and well off and not necessarily marginalised and some of these people we know are joining organisations. Do we have an understanding about what might be the motivation there? Yeah, that's an interesting question because you know, much has been made recently of the fact that a lot of the terrorists are often from quite middle class backgrounds. You know, they're not poor, they're not, uh, a lot of them even weren't particularly religious. Right, what do you think? I actually have a real life example of that. Um, I, I do Muay Thai, Thai boxing as a hobby and at my gym there used to be this uh, German Albanian Muslim guy. Uh, his name is Valdet. He's, he's German, uh, his citizenship, but he's ethnically an Albanian Muslim. And the nicest guy, I mean, he's at the gym, we box together, we practice, he's a professional, he fights on the stage. Uh, I saw him many times out at night clubbing, clubbing drinking alcohol and <laughs> carousing women. He's just a regular guy. And then one day I saw on the news about a German Albanian Muslim leaving his family and joining ISIS. And it's this guy. And later on, I saw on the news that he has been killed in action as part of the ISIS soldiers. So I asked myself, wait a second. <laughs> this is, you know, he's, I mean, he's not rich, obviously, but, you know, he's a regular guy. We do boxing together, we drank together, so on and so forth. How and why did this guy went over from Germany to Syria and join ISIS. And, and again, there's no easy answer to explain the human nature. But I can theorize that he was young, he was impressionable, he was Muslim, he was in a society in a time where Muslims are, quote unquote, the bad guys. He reads about it all the time, he hears about it all the time. I read and hear about it all the time. I mean, I like to debate on internet forum, and every day there's an orgy of Muslim, Muslim hate from everybody else around the world. So when you are feeling hated and marginalized, even though you're not poor, but your ideas and your faith is marginalized, sometimes you act out. Young, impressionable people, middle class people, you, you try to grab onto something, you try to find something. It won't be much different from um, young middle class Americans and Englishmen who joined the Spanish Civil War back 70, 30 years ago, and other examples like that. So, 
Yeah, but that's a very good example because it, and, and I mean, the question I'll throw back at you is since when were revolutionaries and revolutionary leaders marginalised people? They weren't. This is, this is when the history of, of, of what we're now calling extremism and the people who fought, in the, to take your example, in the Spanish Civil War weren't a whole lot of teenage kids. I mean, there was, there always has been a romanticism of war to which, to which people, not only young people, are, are attracted. And, but it's all, always important to remember that the revolutionary movements have not been started by marginalised kids. And, and to remember that someone who is well off uh, but belongs to a particular group, uh, or perhaps not a particular group, as in the case of the revolutionary Marxists, the, the, uh, it can often be driven by an anger, a genuinely righteous, sorry, a, a sincerely righteous anger on behalf of others. And that, that has in fact been the main motivation for the rev revolutionary movements and the main source of their cruelty. The transformation of that anger into a hatred of those who cause that. It's not a positive note on which to finish, but I think it's a very telling one. Would you please put your hands together for our panel? Abdul Abdullah, Raymond Gator, Voronai Vanayaka, thank you very much. <laughs>